Okay, so we have two, two talks in this um, uh, next session, one by Neil Burgess and one by David Tank, uh, about 30 minutes each. First one is by Neil Burgess from University College London, who's going to talk about neural mechanisms of spatial cognition. Neil. Well, yeah, we'll try and be quick. <laughs> The descent. Anyway, I'd like to start by saying what a, what a pleasure and an honor it is to be part of this symposium, um, which has been fantastic to hear so far, uh, and uh, also to, to be part of this field, which, um, as John said, has sort of grown from a, a very tiny field to be an enormous field and in a, in a rather positive and interactive way between all the various groups involved. So I say something a little bit uh, about uh, how these... Uh, uh, neurophysiological findings relate to human memory. As John and, and Lynn said, uh, this was the original driver of uh, trying to understand what these cells in the hippocampus were doing, uh, inspired by HM. And to start with, um, I'm going to pick up a point um, raised by Bruce of these frames of reference. So if I'm recording a cell that responds to some sensory input, maybe ahead and to the right of the animal, then that cell might fire when the rat's over here, and the same cell might fire when the rat's over here. And that would be an egocentric representation of things ahead and right. Whereas if I was recording from a cell uh, that responds to a conjunction of allocentric things, like a distance to the east and to the south, then that cell might fear, fire here. And in that case, the same cell will fire when the animal's here, as Bruce has pointed out. When it's facing the opposite direction, it's still responding to those same sensory features in an allocentric um, directional frame. And the same point... Um, makes sense also for head direction cells, which we'll come back to. And we can think about the brain and perception and action and uh, imagination even tends to be in an egocentric framework, whereas surprisingly, play cells, head direction cells seem to be allocentric. So I, I'm going to start um, one of the first experiments um, that, that um, John was doing when I came to the lab in the early 90s in London. I had originally um, planned to go and work with Bruce because I was interested in computational modeling. Um, when I was uh, working in, in Italy as a computational modeling kind of person. Uh, but I started going out with uh, um, my now wife, and uh, she lived in London, so I went back to London. And, and uh, I'd seen John O'Keefe's name, obviously, in the, in the literature. And so I showed him the proposal that I'd written to go and work with Bruce to do with continuous attractors and this kind of thing. He's uh, nonsense, he says. Uh, but, you know, he, <laughs> fortunately, he offered me a job anyway. Uh, so I went to uh, UCL to um, work with John. <clears throat> and so what we can see from this uh, study here, which was actually inspired by um, Muller and Kuby and Rank recording uh, in place cells in fixed environments. And indeed, in, in Muller and Kuby, 87, they recorded in boxes of different shapes and sizes. You can see this same place cell recorded in these different shaped and sized uh, rectangular arenas, its firing location is strongly influenced by the configuration of, of the boundaries around the animal. And indeed, the peak of firing is, is often at a fixed distance and direction from the north and west walls for this particular cell. But you can see influences of the further walls in, in the way the firing field gets stretched. So uh, this sort of proposed uh, to our minds that there were sensory inputs to these place cells that formed the firing field uh, which might be cells responding at a fixed distance to environmental boundaries. John, for some reason, was very keen on ratios of distances. I, I didn't understand why. <laughs> and they, they, they may still be there, but uh, this seemed like the most um, parsimonious model you could think of. You've got some boundary-detecting cells, which we call boundary vector cells, that fire according to the, um, whether or not there's a boundary in the receptive field of the animal, which is determined by an allocentric direction and distance from the animal. If there's a boundary there, the cell should fire. And if there's a bunch of these sort of randomly chosen inputs impinging on place cells, that will determine where it will fire in a given box. For example, a north and an east tuned boundary detecting cell will produce firing rate maps in square or circular environments like this one or like this one. And if a place cell only gets two of these inputs, presumably there should be more, uh, but this is enough to, to demonstrate how this place cell would fire in the sort of northeast corner of square boxes or the north, near to a boundary to the northeast of the animal, wherever it was and whichever orientation it had. <coughs> and so that's a sort of quant quantitative description of the firing fields of the same place cell in, across different environments. But actually, you know, these cells uh, might exist, and Colin Lever particularly was keen to, to see if this was true, and he recorded... Uh, cells which look like boundary vector cells in reality, 
uh, in subiculum, um, well, in the, in the late 90s and finally published in, in 2006 in a short form. Um, and these cells, you can see, they respond whenever there's, an anim there's the animals near to a boundary in a particular allocentric distance and direction here, sort of east, northeast uh, at a certain distance, or maybe here to the north. And some of these actually fire when the animal is displaced from the boundary some distance like this one. They're not just um, requiring sensory input, uh, tactile input from the boundary. They seem to know where they are from these boundaries. And Colin did various manipulations, including putting a wall into the box and showing a doubling of firing. And uh, for example, recording on uh, two tables that could be pulled apart. And the gap between the two tables also causes the cell to fire whenever that topographical feature is a short distance, in this case, to the south of the animal. And uh, so just to ram home this point, Colin and his uh, postdoc now, Steve Poulter, recorded um, for a long time in, in a large environment to show that you do get uh, cells that are boundary vector cells that do fire at a distance from the boundary here, shown this row of wine bottles. This cell, its firing rate doubles, showing that it is responding to the additional boundary and at a, at a distance from that. And of course, actually, Muller Kubi and, and Muller Kubi and Rank had noticed um, the role of the wall in making these uh, edge fields that are curved uh, early in their, their 87 paper, and this is sort of following up on that. These um, boundary vector cells or, or border cell response have also been found in the entrinal cortex and therefore in medial entrinal cortex. Could be one of these inputs that, that Bruce said, these strong inputs from medial entrinal cortex that tell the cell where it should fire. He won't like that interpretation. So if we're trying to understand how uh, human memory might relate to this kind of cell, uh, we could think about populations of cells. So if we have a population of cells topographically organized, so each circle might be a cell, it might be organized so that its distance tuning shows uh, how far away it is, and its radial tuning indicates its radial position. Now, if this is a boundary vector cell, then up would be north on this picture. And looking down on a population of these cells as the animal was in, say, an environment with this shape, would look sort of like this. There'd be this pattern of activity showing which of the boundary vector cells are active when the animal's in that location in that environment. But equally, these could be egocentric sensory uh, responses, in which case up would correspond to a head in this drawing. And if the agent is actually here facing sort of northeast, <coughs> then an egocentric frame, that would look like this, up being ahead, these are the walls of the environment, and this sort of egocentric representation of boundaries would look like this with activity there. So uh, working with Sue Becker when she was visiting um, my lab in UCL in, in 2001, we tried to make a model of how these kinds of representations could fit together, uh, for example, in human memory, where we think long-term memory in the hippocampus uh, is represented by things like place cells and head direction cells, which are allocentric, whereas we know that uh, action and perception and imagination and the retrieval and imagery of memory uh, must be uh, egocentric. You imagine where things are relative to your head, uh, whether they're ahead or left or right of you. And so we began to put together a model where we had some, you know, if we had boundary vector cells or uh, the egocentric equivalent, which we thought might be in parietal areas, then we need to uh, translate between these two different reference frames. And you can do that using gain field responses, as uh, Puget and Sinowski and other people had shown, where basically you have conjunctive representations of um, whatever it is you're representing here in multiple copies modulated by whichever way you're facing. And that allows you to translate between the egocentric and the allocentric representations of the same thing. And you could do that in either way, bottom up, sensory driven. You could have sensory inputs coming in. They're egocentric and driving allocentric representations according to this translation in the uh, medial temporal lobe to form a long-term representation. Or you could do top-down. You could retrieve something from your long-term memory in uh, medial temporal lobe and drive imagery and action using parietal areas. And here's a sort of close-up of that gain field uh, translation circuit, uh, as I said, taken from Puget and Sanowski's work. But basically, the idea is that you have an attractor system where with these conjunctive gain field neurons in the middle that respond to both direction and location, you can equally go between all of these different representations, your head direction, allocentric boundary location, or egocentric uh, boundary location, 
in all directions you can translate from one to the other. And so one prediction of this sort of model would be that in these areas between the parietal and the medial temporal lobe, like retrospinal cortex, you should see these sorts of conjunctive representations. And there's evidence from several people's labs that some sort of thing like that might be happening, including Doug Nitz and Bruce McNaughton and Kate Jeffrey and uh, Russell Epstein. So this whole thing, if you put together a model, you'd have some attractor system in, uh, for long-term memory, including play cells, boundary vector cells, and boundary identity, what, what the texture and appearance of those things would be, and a translation circuit, perhaps in retrospinal cortex, informed by your heading direction, that can translate between the egocentric perception or imagery and the allocentric uh, long-term memory. So one thing that was missing for a long time from this picture was anything other than boundaries. It was a sort of spatial context model, but there was nothing in the memories. Uh, and so to put objects into these scenes that you could remember or create, we need uh, one more kind of cell. And Actually, early work by um, Rivard and, and Bob Muller showed that there are uh, place cell responses to individual um, objects within the environment, although they're not as common as these responses to boundaries. And more recent work by uh, Jim Neerim <coughs> showing essentially object vector cells, cells that respond at a particular distance and direction from discrete objects, and indeed the traces that you see of them in lateral entorhinal cortex from the Moser group. So if we add those, we end up with a sort of what could be a model of human spatial memory, which would look a bit like this, and it, it's, I understand it's a bit abstract, so I'll, I'll show you a simulation, and that might make it easier to uh, understand what's going on here. So. so what I'm showing you is this is the agent, the rat or person inside uh, an environment here, and these are the boundaries, and this is its egocentric view, so the blue bits are the things ahead of it that it can see and come as visual input. Here we've got a topographically arranged sheet of play cells, and the input at the moment from these boundaries ahead of it is a bit ambiguous, so we see activity here or here, meaning that the animal could be here or here from, from the input it's getting at the moment. This is the egocentric parietal route for the uh, perceptual information, Again, as a topographical representation showing activity across a sheet of neurons. And this is the object or boundary vector cells, the allocentric representation of the same thing. And here's the uh, head direction. These are these perhaps perirhinal, perhaps lateral entorhinal uh, identity cells. Uh, and now we'll see what happens as the animal moves around and encounters an object which needs to be uh, remembered. So this is a familiar environment, and the connections between place cells and boundary vector cells have already been wired up during its experience in this environment. But now for the first time, it's going to uh, encounter an object. So it starts moving, and here's an object. And uh, we'll see what happens now. And it, an object's been encountered by the agent. And you can see there's some activity in the perceptual route here, indicating the presence of the object, and activity of object vector cells here in the allocentric representation. And because there's coactivity of the place cells, and these object vector cells, we can now encode the location of the object by forming associations in this medial temporal lobe attractor between place cells and object cells. So the animal now continues on its way, having encoded the location of the object. Uh, what we'll see is what happens is it normally finds its way around in terms of the sensory inputs coming in to the parietal window and how they get translated to drive place cell activity and boundary vector cell activity uh, in these various figures. How the head direction cells track the orientation of the animal as it moves. And then if we want to investigate um, memory, we need some cue. For example, the agent's wife shouts, where were the keys, which are the object that it just, uh, just saw. And so in this situation, what we can do is drive retrieval by driving up the activity here of the representation of the keys. And because the whole thing is an attractor network, that can force the activity of the whole attractor to recreate the scene at the, uh, location, at the uh, moment when the keys were encountered the first time. So now this activity here has driven the activity of the place cells back to the location where the animal was 
when the keys were encountered. And that's also reactivated the boundary vector cell representation of the spatial scene around the animal. And because this is in memory, actually, although uh, the object vector cell is a north-facing one and the imagined heading direction is north, the uh, presence of the walls and so on behind this location are well known and represented to the animal because this is all part of its long-term memory. And um, although when we translate this into egocentric representations for the imagined scene, the animal will know that behind it is these other walls and so on. And so having reactivated the place cells for the location where the, ident the object was encountered, uh, the agent could then navigate back to that location or indeed just continue on its way uh, having told its wife where the keys were, for example. So uh, having taken sort of rather simple models, firing rate models of all these spatial cells, place cells, head direction cells, boundary vector cells, and object-related cells, we can try to form a neural level representation of what happens in human spatial memory when you go about your normal business. And this is work by Andrei Bukansky in my lab, which we're writing up. So uh, this kind of model, because it's a neural level model, but it's also a systems level model, allows you to interpret things like fMRI when people are doing spatial memory tasks and uh, allow you to speculate that, about the actual functions of the neural activity that you're presumably looking at in these different parts of the brain when you're remembering where something happened. You can also use it to predict uh, search behavior. For example, if you find an object like this flag in a square environment and then you're, you have to go back to where you thought that object was, then if the uh, object was lo located here in this square environment and you're tested in a different shaped environment, the, the model can do a reasonable job of predicting where you will think that object had been given the boundary vector cell uh, representations that you're using for this memory. And so this is sort of a model of imagery or memory or episodic future thinking or scene construction. Psychologists have a lot of different terms for this kind of thing, but the difference here is that we have an idea what all the individual neurons are doing and how that drives the behavior and the experience. So, of course, in a, a uh, symposium in, uh, in honor of Jim Rank, we can't ignore the head direction cells. And all of these same uh, considerations about reference frames and so on also apply to head direction. So if I'm recording a cell here, which uh, might be responding to this landmark at a certain egocentric angle, then that same cell will fire again when the animal's here, because that's the same angle to the landmark. Whereas if it's an allocentric representation to the orientation of the animal in the world, then this cell here fires whenever the animal's heading, say, northeast. And that same cell will fire again when it's over here because it's still heading northeast and not in the equivalent location. So actually, if you want to match these allocentric representations, which, as Bruce has, has said, um, can track our movements using path integration and continuous attractor um, mechanisms, if we want to match those to sensory input from the world to stop drift or to uh, you know, determine the location of the firing in the world, then you still need this egocentric, allocentric transformation in principle because you've got egocentric sensory input and you've got an allocentric representation and they're not going to match up. And actually, Bill Skaggs, um, at one point in the early 90s when I was visiting uh, Bruce's lab, was saying that um, when uh, he was simulating this, uh, what I've called naive model here, apologies for that, the uh, continuous attractor model for the standard model for head direction cells, and you try to give it sensory input from vision, you can't get it to to do the right thing. So as we heard, head direction cells have beautifully parallel responses. Even in the classic uh, Muller-Kubian rank cylinder with a single cue card on the wall. And in fact, if you try and simulate this kind of system getting sensory input from this cue card, you always see parallax. You, you make heavy and associative um, you know, learning to these sensory neurons. And actually, you always get distorted head direction firing pointing towards this controlling cue. And that is because of the egocentric, allocentric transformation that you're missing. Uh, and indeed, you can um, solve it in the same way that we just saw for play cells. And this is one version of par parallax. But in lots of elegant experiments uh, made done by, by um, Jeff uh, Tauby here, you might have two connected environments. And then you see extreme parallax between this environment and this environment. And to solve that, you really need to do something about this transformation. And the same um, proposal works if retrospinal cortex is sitting here between egocentric uh, sensory representations and allocentric uh, medial temporal lobe representations, head direction in this case, then you can make this uh, mapping appropriately uh, 
and you can learn to have parallel head direction cell firing within a small environment and learned consistency of head direction firing as an animal walks between two different environments. So how am I doing for time? I, I'm hoping, okay. <laughs> it's always about five. At least it's not minus five. <laughs> okay, so yeah. going on to uh, grid cells. We've, we've heard about grid cells uh, from Bruce. And um, again, we can't ignore grid cells. Um, so as, as Bruce noted, but uh, in fact was uh, spotted by um, Caswell Barry when he was my PhD student, grid cells uh, exist in modules with discrete um, spatial scale. And indeed, these modules of grid cells uh, also have a clustered orientation. They tend to be aligned with each other. And this was uh, you know, very thoroughly demonstrated by Sten Solotel in the Moser group in 2012. So in terms of our model, I mean, I think there's some consensus that the one thing that grid cells do is probably provide path integration input to things like place cells to update their firing with the motion of the animal. And in terms of this model, uh, you know, that, that would be exactly what happens. Although, of course, uh, allocentric updating of these place cell representations also means that you could uh, imagine moving in an environment if you're uh, in memory retrieval or, or imagining what might happen in an environment. And, of course, that would then be translated in the normal way. Uh, to pr produce an egocentric representation, so you could imagine the view as you as you move within this environment. That might be useful for planning, for example. And if we sort of uh, you know look in a little bit more detail about this interaction between place cells and grid cells, unfortunately, I haven't really got time to talk about that as well. But um, you know, I think people are coming to a realization that. There's a compromise between environmental information and, and self-motion related information, which uh, forms a representation of where you are, perhaps a bit like a Kalman filter. And in doing this, place cells and grid cells have to communicate with each other. And place cells, unlike the early models, are not driven simply by grid cells. But as we had always said, that there's environmental inputs, for example, boundary vector cells, which determines where the firing field is. And this can be updated with motion by input from grid cells. And equally, the reverse connection from place cells to grid cells can help to anchor the grid firing patterns to the environment. Even though they are updated by self-motion, they still need to be stable from trial to trial and day to day and need this anchoring to the environment. I've talked a little bit about this. I don't really have time to talk about this, although we think theta phase precession, discovered by uh, John O'Keefe and Michael Recce, uh, we think that has an important uh, role that it could play in actually doing the translation from movement uh, into uh, well, integrating movement in path integration to update location. So going back to human memory, because uh, we'd noticed that the grid uh, modules were aligned with each other, it might be possible in humans to detect the presence of these populations of aligned grid cells if people are doing a spatial memory task which involves them at least imagining or strongly believing that they're moving in different directions. So in this kind of spatial memory task, coded by John King in my group and uh, used by uh, Christian Dola when it's in my group uh, quite a lot. Uh, we have people exploring in a sort of video game presentation simple circular environments, and then they found some objects and they knew their memory would be tested on where that object was, for example, the duck. And the test would be to be shown the object and put back in the environment and have to go and navigate to where the object had been to, sh to show they remembered its location. So if we have a lot of data of this type while people are in an MRI scanner, then we can look for differences, the consequences of the different uh, neural dynamics that you expect as people move along these grid directions, these six axes of the grid firing pattern in all these aligned grids, or between them. Because as you move along one of these axes, some grid cells will be firing very rapidly as you go through all these bumps of activity, and other ones will be firing not at all. Whereas in intermediate directions, shown here in gray, you get a mixed response, most of the grid cells will be a bit active most of the time. And this difference in neural dynamics, given the very nonlinear link to the uh, blood oxygenation uh, level, should be visible in the MRI signal. And so we looked for it. And you do see this sort of modulation of MRI signal by uh, running direction, modulo 60 degrees, in right enterorhinal cortex, and in lots of other areas, uh, interestingly, all of which are associated with the autobiographical memory system, or we would think systems involved in, in being able to project uh, visual scenes according to imagined scenes or retrieval from, from memory. And the role of the grid cells here might be to move our viewpoint in these imagined scenes. So to test that, uh, Aidan Horner in my group 
uh, did a very similar experiment, but he had people first, when they see the object and they have to remember where it was, imagine moving towards it, and then they actually move towards it. And if we analyze the data in the same way during these imagined movement periods, we see the same six-fold symmetry um, <coughs> indicating the presence of, of grid-like representations or at least 60-degree-like directional representations, again, in, in right endorhinal cortex, when the person is lying there with their eyes closed just imagining moving in a certain direction. So the final point that I want to make is that we've heard about path integration, heard a little bit about sensory inputs. Uh, I've, I've mentioned imagery or imagination. And actually, I think these are all more closely related than uh, people think. So we might oppose, for example, as Bruce did, sensory input um, and path integration uh, as two different kinds of input. And indeed, there are different mechanisms there. But actually, they are quite closely related. So this is an experiment we did with people walking around in fully immersive virtual reality. And we showed that basically we applied a rotational gain to the visual projection as they actually turn in the world. So the visual world turns more or less than they actually turn when they're walking around. Uh, their visual projection looks like they're walking around in this, this rather strange environment. And by doing that, if they take an outward L-shaped path, you can predict where their return path will be according to the relative influence of, on their memory, if you like, for the turn they made from their self-motion or from their visual input. And what you see is that it's about 50-50. They return in a direction about equally weighting these two kinds of inputs. And other people have seen this too. But in a uh, perhaps more interesting experiment, we had people wander around uh, with a gain, a visual gain applied. So they spent 15 minutes walking around, and the visual projection uh, rotating, in this case, less than their actual rotation. And when they'd adapted to that, we could give them tasks saying, you know, making a sound and they had to rotate towards it or asking them to turn through 90 degrees. And because they'd uh, had this period of adaptation, they're now completely in darkness, they over-rotate. And the amount they over-rotate predicts uh, where they will go to if you give them now a classic path integration in darkness task. So having adapted, we made them do triangle completion completely in darkness. They walked out and then they, took, they had to walk back to the uh, start location. And the amount that, of adaptation they'd shown, because of this uh, rotational gain applied to vision, predicted their return direction. And if you think about how this could be wired up in the brain, you basically can't do it if you have separate routes for interception of motion and generation of motion and sensory input and generation of motion. You can't explain these results. What you have to have is a multimodal representation, perhaps a cognitive map, in which Visual inputs are dominant, perhaps, when, when vision is present, but um, it also receives movement-related inputs. And actually, the adaptation changes the gain here. And then even when you're moving in darkness completely, you can still see the effect of the, the visual gain, showing that you need a combined representation. So my final slide is, actually, there's lots of experiments by many of the people here which seem to indicate that all these different spatial representations come together to form a coherent map. For example, the incoherent head directions in two environments that come become coherent when the animal walks between them. The uh, place fields that are originally driven by boundary vector cells in two different environments and fire in similar representations that slowly disambiguate them and remap that uh, Colin Lever looked at. And indeed, uh, with uh, Caswell Barry and, and um, Francis Carpenter, if you record from grid cells in two environments that the animal can walk between, initially the grid cells replicate, driven by the boundary vector type responses, as we see here. But eventually, after enough experience walking between these two boxes, you get one global grid where the, the grid extends between two, two boxes to produce a, a coherent representation. So to conclude, uh, because of all this fantastic work that we've been hearing about, we can perhaps get to a neural level understanding of spatial memory and imagination. And this might be a good point from starting to understand uh, human episodic memory more generally and how it can fail. And a side point, these grid cells form a nice representation for vector relationships, perhaps in general, not just uh, in space. And, and recent work by Tim Burns's group has examined that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neil.